on here. Oh. Hello, hello, everybody. I hope you can all see us and all hear us. Good evening or um, morning, afternoon, wherever and whenever you are watching, whether you are live or recorded. And welcome to the very, very first live event on the Progressive Education Facebook group. The first of many to follow, I hope, if um, Joe will keep you up to date with any future events that, ha that go on in the group. So today we have a fabulous guest who I will be interviewing, who is a really passionate advocate for education that fits everyone. So... Uh, first, a little intro about um, your host for this evening. Myself, I am a coach, I host a podcast, and I'm a community leader who is supporting and inspiring people who want to change the world. I've hosted two series of the Limitless podcast, including interviews with guests who are doing amazing things to shake up the world of education. So this interview today will be featured in series three of my podcast, which is launching in March this year. And I'm thrilled to have been invited to do this live um, to you wonderful lot. So I'm also launching today a brand new community for change makers who want to work and network together. It's available at limitlesscommunity.co.uk and it's, um, to be honest, it's really sort of a pre-launch. Um, I didn't actually think it would be ready for today, but it is. So I wanted to give you guys the opportunity to be the first to come and join the community. I'll talk a little bit more about it at the end of the interview. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to move on to meeting our lovely guest for this evening. So this is... Ellie Costello. Hello, Ellie. I'm just trying to Hello, see evening. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Ellie is a director at Square Peg, who are an organisation who are fighting for an education system that doesn't expect square pegs to fit into round holes. They fight for those who have school-based anxiety, low or no attendance, or have been excluded from school altogether to be able to have the education they need and deserve. So I'll be asking Ellie a bunch of questions while we're here. But if, you'd if you have anything you'd like to ask her, please do pop a comment in the chat below the video and we'll do our best to get all of your questions answered. So I hope everyone can is um, ready to go and it's a real honour to talk to you, Ellie, again, and so lovely to meet you again. So, hello. Hi, I'm so pleased to be here. It feels really wonderful to be sort of launching the inaugural event. I'm just such a privilege, so thank you for asking me. Absolutely. So, tell us a little bit about who you are and how you came to be a director at Square Peg. <sighs> Yeah. Um, so um, first and foremost, I'm mum to two incredible young people, um, 13 and 16. And um, it's fair to say that we, they and us as a family really struggled with um, accessing education um, really from the get go. Um, attendance was challenging. Um, and so we sort of bumbled along for a couple of years and then um, fell out of education due to ill health and then really started sort of experiencing um, changes in the changes in attendance policy. Um, my eldest started school um, just after the coalition came in and by the time he fell out of education in 2014, um, the centre reforms were uh, being rolled out, but also, you know, a zero tolerance, um, much tougher um, behaviour led, um, high stakes testing, um, baseline testing, phonics testing, SATs, loads changed. And so um, it was a bit of a perfect storm, to be honest. 
Um, and that let that experience led to several years of having to fight every single system to access support and care. Uh, NHS, social care, education, centre and inclusion, everybody. Um, and then that 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 led to a sort of awakening of really what's what's going on and a real understanding about um yeah the reality for 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 far too many families and an awareness i suppose that we had um things on our side you know i'm white i'm university educated uh we're a sort of bog standard 2.2 middle class family and so on paper if that if we ended up in the margins like that what's it like for those who have more, even more stacked up against them. Yeah. And I suppose I speak to whoever I speak to sort of working in this sphere of campaign and advocacy and championing change. I think once you sort of have these awareness, awakening moments, um, you can't shake them off. You can't ignore them. Mm. And it becomes like a sort of itch that you've got to scratch and you're just compelled to do more. So, um, we 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 were led to believe that we were the only school refusal family in our in in the world <laughs> and um and, uh, and it, yeah and it's really isolating it's really scary and then um and i didn't even know that school refusal was the term i just knew that we were really struggling and then you know once once we were sort of that full non-attendance um uh, you then start researching and you then start sort of latching on to tag names and thank God for social media because it was Facebook that um, brought me to, um, yeah, loads of parent forum support groups and one of them um, I just happened to get in um, with not finding school. I think I was like sign up number 34 or something um, and there's now more than 21,000 families on there um yeah just a few years later um and um and yeah and that sorry what which one was that that's not fine in school not so in not school. fine in school is um uh yeah just this incredible community that's mm. there for peer support it's just sort of where i feel like my tribe is um and it was a massive massive place of support um in the early days, sort of 2014, 2015, um, yeah, 16, 17. Um, and um, it was uh, while I was on there that that's where I met Fran Morgan, and uh, who's the founder of Square Peg. And um, she and I just sort of started chatting and talked for a good year in advance of, of me joining. And at that point, I just said, I can't, I can't join right now. We were fighting the HCP process and had, you know, a year's worth of non-attendance and evidence and all the rest of it. And I kind of knew that if I was going to do it, I wanted to, to have capacity to do it. Um, and then she came back and said, you know, I think you'd be great. I'm doing it. Do you want to join? And I was like, okay. <laughs> I didn't want the train to leave the station without me, <laughs> without me on it um and um and so we launched we we well we met for the first time in person february 20 um and um had some discussions with um i met the other director simon and um had some discussions and we're like yay we're gonna launch it's gonna be a kick and it's gonna be amazing because fran already had it as a social enterprise and she was registering it and um and we launched and then we went into lockdown one and then we had to work remotely um, and, yeah, do everything that we've done. In fact, I, have, I haven't seen Fran or met Fran in person since, since then. So, wow. so, yeah, so that's, that's how it came to be. So, yeah, it's been busy. <laughs> Excellent. And can you just give us a little bit of um, uh, an insight into some of the work that you do at Square Peg. Maybe give us one or two examples of what you've done. Yeah, it's it's really varied. So at the moment, we're stretched incredibly thin. 
um, because A, there's so much focus on absence and attendance um, within, you know, lockdown and, and post-COVID. Um, but we, we do a lot. So we do quite a lot of policy engagement work. So we're members of the Children uh, Council for Disabled Children's Special Education Consortium, and that helps us to engage with the entire consortium um, uh, and have meetings with the DfE to um, help inform um, send review is a big piece of work, consultations, behaviour consultations, social care consultation. We also contribute to consultations ourselves and, and put submissions in as well. Um, research and academics, we um, reach out and contact them. They contact us. There's loads going on. Um, campaigning, so working with press, um, TV, news, um, yeah, uh, what else? Legislation, so we, we tend to try to link in with um, uh, parliamentarians as well within the Commons and the Lords. Um, it's just non-stop every single day, as well as remain firmly, feet, you know, both feet on the ground with parent voice um, and um, really sort of checking in with lived experience and being a parent carer myself with two sloshing about in the system. So, um, mm. yeah, it's really busy. It does sound very busy. <laughs> yeah. some, just some really fantastic work that you're doing. Um, so what would you say, I mean, you've mentioned, you know, literally a month after you met as a group that you then had to go straight into the first lockdown. Um, would you say that is the greatest challenge you've had to overcome so far or is there something else? Um, well, we, we all lived in different parts of the country, so that was always going to be, uh, we always knew that it was going to be a remote endeavour, if you like. Um, and actually, I, I wouldn't say that was the biggest challenge. I think the biggest challenge is trying to um, become visible, to um, build your credibility, um, to really sort of root yourself as an authentic voice um and um network 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 reach out um you know really just so much network i think our network is absolutely incredible fran did an unbelievable job and she was um really flat out and then i joined and i was like oh there's these people over here and there's these people and do you know about that and let's do that and she was like oh. <laughs> um and um yeah so so there's there's I would say the biggest challenge, I suppose, or just on a personal and square peg level is keeping yourself grounded. So how do you root yourself and not become overwhelmed with the sheer scale of the problems, um, the amount of attention and sort of noise that's around? How do you sort of plant your feet and remain focused on, on the work that needs to be done? And um, Fran and I talked about this a lot. There's like so many shiny things that you can run towards. And how do you sort of, um, in the early days, how do you, you, you need to sort of reach out and make contacts? Um, and um, Fran and I both really agreed as well that so many discussions around education are just within education. And actually, um, you know, we both sort of come from creative backgrounds and you've got to think about this outside the box. And often some of the most um, valuable conversations are by people who, who don't have any skin in the game, who are coming at it with fresh mm -hmm. eyes or who maybe have a sort of sense of, of maybe they do have skin in the game, but they're not necessarily embedded in education itself. And I think I think that's another challenge as well, because there's an awful lot of sort of tension and um, defensiveness with uh, when you're trying to have courageous conversations about improving education or children suffering in education. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's really hard um, to sort of try to keep keep connecting with people and to not just be overwhelmed by the tsunami of of mess <laughs> mm. that can yeah. be really hard yeah. that's a really I mean it's a really interesting challenge I think it's a challenge for anyone who's like try and impact change but particularly yeah. the for the sort of work you're doing the campaign work 
you've got your big you know lofty dream of where you where you believe you can end up but that has to be underpinned by what am I actually doing this week you know or who am I who's the one person I need to speak to kind of thing and yeah. yeah, when you're small and you've got no infrastructure, you know, you're kind of jack of all trades as well. So it's just like, there's so much that I've realised that I just took for granted when I was employed with an employer, that, mm. you know, everything like you phone the IT help desk and, you know, there's yeah. just like, there's just bog standard stuff that you you don't have to do. Mm. And and particularly in the third sector as well, where you're, you know, fundraising, funding, investment, it's really scary when you're small. And also it's really hard mm. to um, make those connections because most major charities have business development units who, uh, you know, th they're, they're there to, to, to keep to keep the organization sustainable and they're going for big huge amounts of money um i read some stat just before christmas um that said that i think um something like 98 percent of charitable investment goes to six percent in the third sector of organizations mm. and um don't quote me but it's it's kind of it's it's in the 90s and it's the less than tens <laughs> you know it's in that proportion yeah. um and so you know for small organizations who really are rooted in grassroots um contact and and this is where I think Square Peg is so exciting because it is led by those with lived experience. Mm. Um, and that is so valuable. And in fact, a lot of the contacts that we're getting at the moment from researchers, um, uh, yeah, everybody that we um, come into contact with, um, they're all, you know, there is a growing realisation that listening to lived experience and not just talking to them as a tick box exercise, but really valuing the expertise that's there um, is vital. We're not, we're not going to get out of, we're not going to find the solutions we want that deliver long term improvements mm -hmm. without, without speaking to those who have been through the mill. Mm. Um, and that's really hard because um, a lot of the work that I initially did, you're coming from a place of activated trauma as well. So, you know, you're turning up at meetings and I do a lot of work locally in Warwickshire, which I really value and I'm incredibly proud of, where you're aware that you've got people who, who are service providers or commissioners or whoever it is, and you're aware that they are, um, they're aware that stuff isn't right, but they're really trying to get it right, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, or they're so far in the defensive that they're just, they're so burnt out that that blocked care is there. And they're just like, oh God, we've got those with lived experience in the room. Um, and so you can have some really tense conversations, but that's what the heart of co-production is and I think we we have to value those who have been through it who could talk in very visceral terms about well well you know that's that suggestion you're going to do that's going to completely alter that policy um you know here's why that's not going to work and 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 their insight is so um uh searing you know it's a, mm. it's it's um it's, incre it's incredible, I think, to be in a room with EBEs who aren't going to mince their words and who are there to make improvements because they don't want anyone else to go through what they went through. Mm -hmm. um, but but that's that's how we find the creative solutions. And an, an EBE will often sit there and kind of go, well, you know, has anyone considered that? And you can see sort of light bulbs going off. It's like, it's it's just and then to see that transform into into policy change and practice and to be able to influence and to know that you're coming from a place of all that trauma and experience but you're actually able to effect change and and hopefully believe that in some small way it's not it's going to improve for those coming through behind you that's why you do it i think yeah. have you um have you seen that work where you've had like uh, a really, as you say, like visceral, honest, true story 
that has changed the minds who, of whoever you were sitting with. Um, yeah, one one of the one of the projects I'm really proud of is a is a project that is now nationwide, but we were an early adopter, early, um, early pilot. Mm. Um, local area and it's a project out of the long-term plan the NHS long-term plan the 10-year plan they did a five-year plan then they did a 10-year plan and um, there's some really great intention intentions that were sort of laid out we will do this we will make these improvements and and, and it was all funded and one of the projects was um, one of the commitments out of the long-term plan was to improve uh, reduce health inequalities and improve life expectancy and outcomes for those with a diagnosis of learning disability or autism mm. and the project was uh, the kit's called the key worker it's not a pilot but it's the key it is the key worker scheme um, and it's now nationally rolled out. And um, there was myself and and um, a couple of other EBEs, um, a few of which were young, um, tier four experienced. Um, so they'd been inpatient for CAMS. And um, to hear that to hear that testimony, to sort of really understand impact and experience and then to try to think creatively about what improvements okay so that was awful and that happened what can we learn from that mm. and to be there alongside that young person and to sort of puzzle it through and then I was bringing my experience as as a parent carer as well so sort of thinking about for a younger child for whom I was having to advocate within the mental health service um, and um, to sort of talk about, yeah, just how you're treated and perceived often as a parent um, uh, is, uh, yeah. So, so some of the some of the best um, decisions that or sort of outcomes that I've seen is that we we collaboratively and collectively built a service that is now functioning and supporting these children and young people. Um, between the ages of 14 and 25 and the outcomes that we're seeing are incredible so there's like a huge um, load of um, interest around one of the proposals I made around um, not discharging families so that they remain open to a service um, and using the example under consultant-led care for long-term conditions or even primary care being registered with the GP mm. and just sort of sharing that and saying you know it's really alerting and triggering this kind of um, discharge model that happens so you spend so long getting into the service and then you get the support and then oh, within seconds they're wanting to discharge you and ha what's the solution for that so we gave a solution and 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 so the feedback from families accessing the service and young people now is oh my God, you know, this part of the service is so good. You know, we're, mm. we've we um, avoided um, all sorts. We've avoided, yeah, we've, yeah, we've avoided um, uh, life attempts and um, uh, custodial sentences and young people are thinking about returning to education um, or training. And it's just like, just from that, you know, from a multitude of, of solutions, yeah. but that was one of them that I can think of that I'm just like, wow. I can see I somebody's wanna, asked what an EBA is. Yeah, I just is. want to take a moment there, Ellie, just to just say that's just so amazing. Like, how awesome that you've had a part to play in such personal stories. Like, yeah, just... It's really yeah. amazing. And it was such a simple idea to me, and I understood that... I had to evidence it. So if you can evidence it elsewhere in the systems, it's kind of like, oh, okay, well, that's what happens over there, so we can do it. <laughs> so mm. I was kind of like, well, my son's got multiple um, uh, um, health needs and he's mm. under several consultants. And while he's, you know, within pediatrics, he's under long-term care and he gets, you know, so mm. you're able to kind of go, well, that happens under consultant led care and also just holding upholding, for example, primary health care. You mm. know, wouldn't it be ridiculous if every time we were cured of something, our GP signed us off and then we'd have to get back into the system and, mm. you know, yeah. evidence needs. And 
so it it does happen elsewhere but because of you know um, services trying to track data and not have too many people on, in the service um, there's this there's this discharge model which is mm-hmm. just preposterous because particularly when you're thinking about mental health it's often chronic and it often takes a long time to recover mm-hmm. and to mm-hmm. heal and having the certainty of access to the very people that helped you get back on your feet um, mm-hmm. that's invaluable absolutely yeah. invaluable and, and that that builds capacity and resilience in that person. Mm. So it was really obvious to me, and I can't believe it's it was that earth shattering. But there we are. It was. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing. Like when you're, as you say, you've got a different perspective. You've got a different lived experience, and you can just see something that people who've been in it for so long can't see. They literally can't see it. So. That's what. I'm, that's the nuggets yeah. that are there. As somebody's asked what an EBE is. Um, yes, Elizabeth. I'm so glad, Elizabeth. I'm so glad you asked that because I'm sorry. Was terrible, <laughs> terrible for abbreviations. Um, expert by experience. So it's a recognised within NHS. Uh, there's some really great experts by experience programs where those with long term health conditions are engaged with. It's a much more established model over in the NHS we're mm. trying to trying to bring it into, into um, education. yeah and education um it's 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 recognized in research as well and academia but again often it's just seen as like a half hour interview to sort of you know um, yeah. capture capture lived experience but then you don't follow through and and really sort of dig in and kind of think about the solutions together with that with those people with that group yeah. so it's it's massively important so mm-hmm. i think that 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 expertise is almost the world can't function unless we're rooting mm. ebes at the center of everything you know mm-hmm. if you think about um uh you know just little ideas for how I don't know there's some really great example with um what do you call it when they've got the um like community assemblies they're like um the people's assembly or whatever it's called where Mm. they've got local um uh meetings for for local residents in an area to come together and sort of puzzle through what's the best thing for this area if we've got a regeneration project or Mm -hmm. and it's like that but EBEs is focusing on those who have suffered in the systems Mm, mm. and really listening and then and then embedding them as consultants in a project so Mm. they're essential knowledge it's funny isn't it because the when you say that which is essentially let's work with people who are actually experiencing this every day or have been it seems so blindingly obvious like why would you not do that really um but yeah a lot of services well, a lot of services don't, and mm. a lot of organisations don't, because working with EBs can be really challenging because they don't mince their words, they don't talk corporate speak. Yeah. Um, they're it's often really raw to be around. Um, yeah, there are the adversity that they've been through, mm. and you'll often have sort of policy or corporate you know local government or whoever it is just wanting to get on with the job of writing the policy and delivering the service that that you know from from the public purse um but too often you know despite the very best intentions those services don't meet the needs of the communities they're meant to deliver to Mm. um and so um that's where you get angry people so just think thinking about sort of um what we do as square peg in terms of campaigning is is it's a really fine art not to sort of find yourself becoming too ranty because if you're coming from a place of anger just like you know you can get um press and politics talking from a place of fear you know it's it's very emotive isn't it and so when you're in those very extreme emotional places you're not necessarily thinking about either expressing yourself so that you will be heard 
mm-hmm. or seeking to understand opposing views or, or different reasons for being. Mm-hmm. And I think parents are given a huge disservice because they're seen as, oh, I mean, there's various various names that we're given over since I've entered this world in 2014, you know, send parents have pointy elbows or or some parents want the moon on a stick. I've heard that from educators. Mm-hmm. Nice. Um, you know, don't talk to parents because you know you've got to, got to treat them with a firm hand. I heard a teacher saying, "Treat them with a firm hand. Give them an inch, and they'll take a mile." Because there's this sort of idea of entitlement and all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. And so, when you've got these perspectives towards parents broadly, who often are a huge mine of information, engagement, intention. And you're presuming that they're just going to get in the way of your valuable work. Mm-hmm. Again, just going back to that theme that you're you're, you're not going to you, you a you're going to start doing too. So then I'm sort of thinking about disability rights language, which is you know you can do to, you can do for, or you can do with. And the mm-hmm. the best one that 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 um, has the best outcomes and the longest term outcomes is doing with but that's really hard if you're the service provider or the you know commissioner or the policy writer you want to go through your process of research evidence presenting and you know rolling out and delivery that's what you and and then and then you'll go back into a review phase and you'll all look at it in a room and stroke your beards and go hmm Working with EBEs or any anyone who's got skin in the game takes longer. Not only is it more challenging, but it takes time. So why would you do it? Mm. But the thing is, is that with the people that I work with strategically, without a doubt, all of them, I know, I know this because they've told me, I've been like, I've never really understood the benefit of co-production or, or working with um those with lived experience or family voice or whatever, I've never really got it. I've realized that we weren't doing it right because we were just using it as a consultation, a public consultation or a local consultation. So it was just like a sort of opinion gathering so that you can what put in a, put in a report, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but also it, it kind of, it, it brings with it tensions because as, as, as the writer of the, of the, of the policy, whatever it is, or the document, you're mm. going to have this tension within you that have, have we got it right? I think this is a good idea, but I don't actually know. And I don't know because I haven't brought people who might mm. know by being failed along with me to kind of check some balance and sort of puzzle it out together. That's what, you know, design led thinking is all about. It's kind of like not coming in with a predetermined agenda and um really being open i think you know i think i come back to brené brown a lot it really does sort of invite that level of vulnerability and it takes a lot of courage and and if you've got a day job which is you know developing a new service and you've got x million to do it and you've got a team of people to help you think about it you'll stick with that won't you you won't necessarily um reach reach out of your circle mm. um so it's, and, I mean, it's a, it does, really hard. Yeah, well, I, I was just thinking, like, it does take a level of vulnerability as well because essentially the first thing that you've got to own up to is that I don't know everything. You know, I, yeah. I don't know, which is why I've got to go and find the people who live it who do know. So, yeah, I can totally see why um, that's a really difficult thing for people to to do, actually. Yeah, so, courageous conversations, that's what I'd say, one of the most difficult things to have from a grounded, regulated, open and curious place. Really mm-hmm. hard to get that right. Oh, yeah, so much. So we've got a couple of questions from um, from people who are watching. So, um, Ellie, how does Square Peg manage the influences of globalisation on education? which tends to mould students for the global economy and equip them with 21st century skills? That's a big question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> well, what's, what's interesting is what it, so if I'm, th- so 
yeah so influences of globalization you know i'm instantly thinking about you know being a world citizen how can i be prepared for you know to how can how can we collectively nurture young people to be ready for a truly global mm. existence because it's it's the most connected it's ever been um and and how can we learn from what's happening elsewhere globally in terms of education? Um, how are other people doing it? What's working? What isn't? And I think there's such an enormous amount of great stuff that's going on. Um, and yeah, so to answer the question, how do we manage the influences? We just get washed over by an awful lot of the time. So it's it's really hard because if you're thinking about uh, marketization of education, for example, the, the mm -hmm. fact that it's, it's a commercial enterprise in many ways, um, you've, we, here we've got the tensions between independent and mainstream education, we've got academization, we've got a lot of sort of external influence just within England, let alone the UK mm -hmm. alone. And then there is, you know, you'll have ministers flying around the world to see how everyone else does it. And then sort of coming back with a mm, great idea, which boom, it's policy. And, you know, families and children and, and the sector, the prof education profession are normally, <laughs> you know, it's like mm -hmm. sort of hit between the eyes. So we've had seismic shifts that have been allegedly influenced by uh, the American education system, um, what's going on in the Far East, you know, it's kind of cherry picking little bits and sort mm. of trying to implement it on what we have here, which is one of the oldest formal education systems in the world that really hasn't um, uh, improved in terms of you know, you, there's the memes going around, isn't there, with the edu the Victorian classroom versus the current classroom, and it virtually mm. looks exactly mm. the same. Um, so, you know, how do how do we manage that? Well, that's all happening, but for me, I'm constantly looking at what's going well elsewhere, um, mm. and there's some absolutely brilliant um, work that's going on within. Um, uh, yeah, self-directed education and the whole, um, world school movement and and thank heavens for the internet because we are more connected and more able to find out about and find tribes in other parts of the world that we wouldn't necessarily ever know about unless we, you know, was able to go on a sabbatical and travel the world. So, um, yeah, that... I, I would say we don't manage it at all. We it, it just feels like a sort of constant. I often feel like I'm one of those little worm corals in the current. <laughs> and some days I've got both arms out and I'm like, yay! And other days I'm just like, Dum. I can't actually take any more because it's too big. And it's just, mm -hmm. you, again, it's that sort of shiny things in the shop. What what am I what what am I drawn to? And and I'm a terrible magpie as well. So mm -hmm. if I hear, a, if I sort of see or hear something in, in on, on socials that's exciting, I'm kind of like, oh, I've got to share that with as many people as possible. Um, sort of get it out there and mm -hmm. love bomb the world with the bits of nuggets that I'm finding and hope that it sort of gets carried around. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> How do you ground yourself, Ellie? Like, I love that analogy where you're just like, I'm a worm, I need to like uh, get into the ground and like hide for a second. Like, what's your favourite thing to do to like, okay, I'm just going to take a breather for a second, you know, get back to normality for a moment? Well, I'm really lucky. So I've been accessing a therapeutic space since my kids um, uh, fell off the edge of the world. And so for me, checking in therapeutically with my little pockets of support with professionals who are able to compassionately listen mm. has been an enormous um, benefit to me. And it really helps me to kind of just connect and and just be grounded because a lot of it is sharing the overwhelm and sharing often sharing despair as well you know you just the juggernaut of what's going on out there and knowing that children are suffering and parents are battling and that feels really 
massive and then the conversations around you know what covid has done in terms of increasing adversity and and then there's you know climate change and and there's mm. you know uh, oh and now now that um the news is sort of lifting its head from covid there's now sort of greater awareness with what's going on with you know tennis players being you know deported from countries or tanks lining up on the ukrainian border and and mm. it's just kind of like oh how do i oh, yeah it's just so much so uh for me accessing therapy really helps um there's a brilliant uh meditation that i do by sarah blondin uh which is just helps um and yeah she's um, she's amazing and um and then just trying to um trying to talk kindly to myself so when i'm feeling overwhelmed it's just really sort of improving on 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 recognizing that i'm overwhelmed and accepting that i am and just going it's perfectly understandable that you feel this way that's yeah. okay tomorrow feels a bit big yeah. let's start again tomorrow yeah. um so that that sort of inner dialogue um i've learned to do as a result of accessing some incredible therapeutic support mm. And and so that lived experience of that person speaking to me that way has become my internal voice as well, um, because it's it's just delivered on repeat that kindness and that mm -hmm. compassion, and that just yeah that's that that's what helps me. Uh, I haven't got anything that earth shattering apart from that. And then there's always chocolate, isn't there? That's quite <laughs> good. <laughs> chocolate it's wine. <laughs> Crack open the chocolate. I love it. Yeah. Um, so I've got a question from Sarah who asks, do you work with the Children's Society? No, know. we don't. But do you know what? Isn't it crazy how the universe sort of brings you names? That's the third time in a week that somebody has asked me that. Interesting. So I'd, I'd, the universe is, is showing me that and I, I better get on, get on with yeah. it and reach yeah. out to them. You know what you're doing straight after this interview. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly that. It's really weird how the universe does that. I do, I do sort of just sometimes it's like somebody somewhere is telling you do that, do that, do that. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Sarah. Yeah. I will. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Clues definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, another Sarah asked a question. Um, have you seen more awareness in schools around well-being and mental health since the beginning of the pandemic? Um, what are schools doing, if anything, to support children? And what sort of support do you think could be easily implemented? Ooh, that's a triple question. Right. Yeah. We'll start, so, let's start with it. <laughs> uh, yes. So the, I think there was an awful lot of awareness around mental health and well-being. I think school pre-pandemic, I think schools were seeing broadly that kids were kids were struggling and their own workforce was struggling you know with burnout and block care and all sorts so i think that awareness was there but i think it was sort of butting up against a rigid sort of determination to really clamp down you know and 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 to sort of stick to the rules and this is our policy and zero tolerance and you know it didn't do me any harm so you know suck it up and get on with it oh the number of times i've heard that yeah, and I, in fact, I was on Twitter today, so I've just been doing my first Twitter day today, which is a terrible time vacuum, but also brilliant. Um, <laughs> but one of the things I was talking about is whenever you, whenever we're sort of presented with these opinions, it's the shield of shame. So um, Kim Golding, um, she's amazing, her books are amazing, talks about the shield of shame, which is dim dismiss, deny, defend. So whenever you're just sort of delivered or or you meet this really intolerant or angry or defensive um comeback to mm. suffering or adversity or struggling or vulnerability you know you've got shame in the room the other person is is sort of reacting through mm. shame whether or not they're aware of it that's what it is and she talks about the sort of three prongs of the shield of shame so dis dismiss deny defend um, and in the middle, you've got anger and rage. Mm. Um, and so um, 
you know, if we're thinking about, um, so shame is directly linked to trauma. Trauma is stress. Where you've got toxic stress sloshing about in systems. I mean, arguably, I was saying this to someone the other day, arguably modern life is stressful, more mm. stressful than it's ever been. What our children are expected to do, what working families are expected to achieve, accomplish and, you know, um, and and do is is off the scale. Mm. Um, even to when I entered the workforce, you know, 25 years ago. So, um, you know, it it's even looks very different now. Mm. Um, so the, yeah, so the amount of stress, the amount of trauma that are in systems that's just sort of buffeting about. Mm. Um, and toxic stress is where it's chronic and pervasive and it, it doesn't let up. And that's where capacity and resilience, um, uh, you know, is uh, ebbs and disappears. Mm. So within schools, you know, there was a, there was this sort of psychological dissonance in, you know, policy is saying zero tolerance, behaviour, attendance, you know, tough love, cruel to be kind, all of that. That's that's what's been coming out since broadly since 2014. Mm. Um, and then there's the sort of awareness that, oh, my God, this isn't actually working and it's making things worse and it's driving up mental health and, and, and. And so to be a professional in the sector and to have to deliver that, I think, must be really challenging. Mm -hmm. But the flip side is, is that you'll have professionals who go, nope, we'll double down and we'll do it. We'll do it twice as much, <laughs> you know, because actually mm -hmm. then admitting that it's not working is is even harder mm. so to answer the question yes i think there was an awareness um i think covid gave legitimacy to actually accepting that truth that mm. it's happening it's endemic it's mm. huge um and it's escalating beyond our control um yeah that that that's that's what covid has done is that mm. you know there's there's been a legitimacy to the conversation thank heavens um, and what kind of support um, do you think could be easily implemented or, or what are schools doing? I think there isn't enough reporting, actually, on what schools are doing well and what they did well throughout this last two years. Um, mm -hmm. You know, many teachers and school leaders were just like, we, we're going to be holding on to, you know, well-being and welfare and pastoral and all the rest of it and I've heard stories of schools who actually didn't you know rush towards lost learning and catch up curriculum and nose mm. to the grindstone straight away and I, I think that's been massively underreported yeah. and lost yeah. um, and so inquiries I know to trauma-informed practice trauma-informed organizations um, there's some brilliant work by Dr Karen Treesman out there um, Trauma-Informed Education brings together three organisations working in this area. Um, there's just some, there is some brilliant engagement that was already happening and I think it's gathered pace. So I think school mm. leaders have just gone, do you know what, let's run towards that. Let's look at more attachment um, aware whole school approaches, mm. which, you know, are drawn on neurobiology and connection and relationships. So I think, I think it's, it's all happening and I think, um, it's actually so what do you think could be easily implemented this is the thing is that there's you've you've kind of just got to go for it so in terms of it's and also it's a lived practice so if any school that I knew was looking towards a trauma-informed attachment focused relational um, philosophy to roll it out you can't really cover it in one twilight session it's something that is mm. you have to live and walk and breathe and be supported to do that by the professionals who really understand it so that when it goes wrong because it will go wrong and you will you one does get it wrong because mm. there'll be a child that really sort of breaks through your training um, or a group or a day in the week that you just sort of, you know, lose your biscuits. So, um, and and therefore, in order to remain on track, you need the professional support and reflective practice um, and scaffolding to sort of go, 
go back and, and recover. Mm. Um, so, so there's no sort of easy, quick fix. But once you start doing it, it feels easier, and you wonder why you never did it. Yeah, that yeah. Now, I wonder if that'd be something really nice for people to share in the group. Actually, like if anyone has any examples or stories that they've seen of. Um, schools that are not focusing on catch-up education but are instead focusing on how they're harnessing you know well-being and trauma-informed um, support for children maybe share that in progressive education it'd be great for everyone to be able to read that so yeah I mean there's been some really interesting discussions on self-directed learning as well which mm. I have real hope that you know there's a sort of little nuggets of 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 intention within mainstream education to potentially explore more student participatory led kind of um yeah areas of work whether you know how that's done I don't know but you I could definitely get the sense that that COVID has sort of given legitimacy to exploring new things and experimenting we've, we've got a book coming out I'm going to plug that so we've got a book coming out um in the spring square pegs which is aimed at um inspiring and empowering school leaders and uh, to do the right thing by square pegs but actually as I keep on saying whatever you do for the most vulnerable will benefit all it's a win-win for everybody mm -hmm. so um one of the um uh, yeah, we've had so many contributors. It's just been such a joy. And we're in a really tight, hard edit at the moment. So it's just like, oh. Um, but there was one of the contributors that we spoke to um, over in America. He was talking about the beauty of scientific exper experimentation. So you don't actually, as a school or an organization, have to implement something and stick with it, even if it's not working. You can actually just do little pockets of experimentation and see how it works. You don't have to do this big sweeping change. And actually, if you are, and he said, if you're looking at it from a scientific sort of model you expect it to fail you ex you know you, you don't expect every experiment to work you know you're, you're looking for what doesn't work actually um and so i love this idea of of just trying things out you know you you, you could try it with a small cohort you know or just a, a small group and then roll it out on a larger scale there's all sorts of ways that you can you can achieve change and it doesn't need to be this whole system thing all at once and mm. i think that that sort of beauty of experimentation i i really like that idea it's it's enabling isn't it yeah absolutely and and so much easier it's like kind of like okay this feels doable we're not changing everything at once we're just doing yeah it. somebody said uh, you know i always come back to this uh, this is when i ground myself so it's the the expression which is you know how do you eat an elephant it's like one small bit at a time and mm. and I just kind of think that's yeah you've you've got that's to yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, I completely agree so I've got a really lovely final question from Su uh, Susan she says can mainstream education get better at incorporating neurodivergence because so many parents meet flat denial is there hope for change I'm really hoping that you say yes, but I'd like to hear from from you, from your experience. Do you feel like there is hope for change? I, yeah, I really think that I, I, I'm so if you'd spoken to me six years ago when I was in the depths of, you know, suffering, <laughs> watching my children suffer, um, would I have said that there was something that was you know that things were going to change and um, what happened was our experience i don't know whether the school in question will agree but our experience led to change within that school and it led to you know yeah shifting paradigms and a different you know a movement in culture and practice and greater understanding and all the rest of it and that's not to say that we weren't met, met with dismissal and denial <laughs> For quite quite a while um so but but that experience showed me the power of 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 influence i suppose um mm -hmm. i wanted my kids to be the guinea pigs that caused the change but that's what happened and so in terms of neurodivergence I, there was there's a um 
uh, an event that I saw on Twitter today, my first Twitter today, um, with, um, with um, I think it's ACAM um, uh, are running it. Um, and one of the um, keynote speakers at the beginning is talking about how the um, uh, uh, neurodiverse community and the demands that they've made and the challenges that they've given to academics and to in in the way that um, neurodivergence is expressed, um, that it's not seen as a deficit, that it's actually seen as a benefit. And the opening um, uh, uh, talk is all about how in, how incredible this could be in terms of changing the way that things are researched, understood, talked about broadly. Mm. Now, that for me is one of the most powerful cases for change and 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 reasons. You know, that gives me hope. Um, mm. That's thanks to any individual who's neurodiverse. Um, you know, out there championing change, your voices are being heard. They absolutely are. Your challenges are being taken on board, and I think that's across the board. We see, we saw that with disability rights in the in the seventies and eighties, and we saw that sea change mm. that happened. Any protest, any um, loud, um, repetitive message can't be ignored, and I mm. think it really is. It really is happening. One of the things I have to hold on to when I'm doing a lot of strategic work, particularly large system public sector stuff is I've, I've got to ground myself in the fact that whatever change is happening most of it won't be seen for five to ten years in terms of a sort of wide change yeah. so there'll be little pockets of it and you'll see the early adopters and but it, it you what I personally may not experience it my children certainly won't because they'll be out of the system so you you've just got to hold on to the fact that the messages are getting through you just mm -hmm. may not see the instant response that you mm -hmm. need to see, understandably. Um, but yeah, it's it's incredible, and that's what activism can do. It's it's mm -hmm. incredible, really, so the, the changes that can be made. And how like how amazing to be involved in something which which are, is making those changes and leading those changes. So just amazing. I love the work that you're doing, Ellie. Um, oh. Just as a just as a final thing, then um, where um, where can parents go? There might be some parents or possibly even teachers here um, who feel that their children are the square pegs. Where can they go for help? Yeah, well, we we work really closely with another organisation called Not Finance School. So it's www.notfinanceschool.co.uk, um, and there's a closed. Uh, the Facebook group is Not Finding School Family Support, that's for parents. And then there's another group, which is Not Finding School um, Parents and Professionals um, uh, resolving, resolving Difficulties, I think it is, or Coming Up With Solutions. I can't remember what it is, but it's working together. So those are two really great discussion places. There's a whole plethora of um, other discussions. Um, Send Crisis, Do A Lot, Send National Crisis, um, there's a brilliant teacher-led um, or, or sort of, um, a group called the Recovery Curriculum, which sprouted out um, sprouted up during um, uh, first lockdown by Dr. Barry Carpenter out of Oxford University. And the uh, yeah, the Recovery Curriculum was something that they developed um, in order to help schools open, and it was all pastoral and. Um, and uh, giving schools and teachers resources to support children and themselves. Um, so that's a really lively place to go as well. Um, yeah, there's there's so much going on. There's also the um, Rethinking Education have a group on the Mighty Network, which is all about thinking about the future of education. Joe's mm -hmm. got progressive education where there's just some brilliant uplifting stories going on there. Um, it's lovely. It's kind of the, mm. the sort of these little pockets where it feels meaningful and mm. positive, um, as well as challenging. I don't think you can. I don't think mm. you can have the positives without being challenged. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, go connect. Go find people who are going through what you're going through and share that. You know, share the joys and the pains and all of it. And 
yeah, that's how we'll get to somewhere better together. Definitely. Come and find us uh, at Team Square Peg as well on Twitter um, and the website yeah. www.teamsquarepeg.org. Uh, come and find us, um, although we, our inbox is groaning. <laughs> so um, give me a while to reply. But yeah, we'd love anyone who wants to connect, please reach out. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ellie. It's been a pleasure to talk to you this evening. It's been a pleasure to host this live on Progressive Education. Thank you so much to Joe Symes, who manages the group, for setting this up. I think what you're doing is amazing. So just I can't wait to see this grow even more and for there to be more events and everything. So Thank you so much. Um, so remember, this interview will be available on my podcast, on the Limitless podcast, um, Series 3, which is launching in March. Um, <clears throat> that's available on all your standard podcast apps. And also, if you go to limitlesscommunity.podbean.com, you can find it there. Um, if you've enjoyed this interview and enjoyed being part of the group, please do share this with your friends and family and teachers and whoever else you think could benefit from this group because the more we have the more people we have here um the better it gets so that's that would be absolutely amazing um also make sure that you check out the progressive education website um that joe has set up so um i think all links are probably in the group somewhere or um joe will put something on there so that's absolutely um, amazing. And lastly, um, if for those who think that they'd like to stand up and make a stand and do something like Ellie is doing, um, why not come and work with um, other change makers in my brand new Limitless community? So as I said before, you can access that on limitlesscommunity.co.uk. Um, it's very as i said it's very brand new so i'll be developing the structure and the content of that over the next couple of months um but expect there to be opportunities to chat and network with other people who are making change um to get guidance from me on how to make that sort of change happen for you if you're finding blockers and barriers in your life where um you're struggling to make it happen um some interesting science behind how our brain creates opportunities and barriers for us and the neuroscience behind that to help you get over those um, and potentially coaching opportunities, co-working groups, guest presentations, all that kind of thing. So and that's going to be building over the next couple of months. So come and join us there. Um, and it would be absolutely great to see you. So thank you so much, everybody. Um, it's been really exciting to be like the first live session in here. And um, I hope that you've all enjoyed the interview this evening. So I think it's time to say good night. But thank you so much, Ellie. Thank you, Joe, And thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you for having Goodbye. me. Bye. <laughs>